Hello. Hello, everybody out there in Book Trib land. Welcome to another live chat in the CEO series, the business series um, today on, on Book Trib. We have uh, all the way from the Netherlands, we're very excited to have him. We have Joris Merckx, and he is with uh, Google, Google's European Head of Insights Communication. And he is author of, author of a new book called Think and Grow Digital, what the net generation needs to know to survive and thrive in any organization. What a fascinating concept. This book is published by McGraw-Hill. Um, uh, Yora shows how millennials can thrive in, in, in a digital corporate world, still dominated by the older generation, while also retaining their own ideals and values. And that's something that... Um, it's a fascinating topic. I know you might, you've been interviewed all over about this, and we'd love to, to have a little bit of a, a, of a discussion on what the response has been to the book, Yoris. Welcome. Hi there. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, well, it, it has been very great so far. The, the, the best response so far came from uh, uh, our CEO, uh, Eric Schmidt, who is the Let's say, well, he's not the CEO anymore. He used to be the CEO. Right now, it's Larry. They switched uh, roles. And, That's right. Uh, and the book had actually, Eric Smith himself also published the book at the same time. And uh, both books were covered in, uh, in the New Yorker magazine in one article. So I actually got a personal email from him uh, with congratulations about the book. So that was really nice. Fantastic, fantastic. And you've been doing interviews around the U.S. and also uh, in Europe about the book? Yeah, well, I have to balance it a little bit because my focus for Google is uh, on the Netherlands. and uh, mm -hmm. But I get a lot of interviewing requests from the States and uh, also speaking engagement requests. So I uh, now have a bit of a, an arrangement that allows me to take unpaid leave every now and then so I can travel to the, to the States uh, for, to, to do stuff for my Google books. Well, we're, we're fascinated here with Google. I mean, everybody wants to know a little bit more about Google. So, um, so that's part of the reason we were excited to have you on, to have better understanding. I'm sorry this isn't a Google Hangout, but it is um, a Spreecast live stream, which we do really well with. Let's get right, right to what's really important. What is the ultimate career opportunity for millennials? How can they succeed? And um, what, what is your advice on how to, how to be part of an organization and really add value? I think all millennials have one big asset, and that is the fact that they are di digital natives. So the, they are born, from, from the day they were born, the internet was there. So for, to them, it's as normal as, as drinking water. And I think they, they can't even imagine a world without it anymore. And what I see in my work is when I speak to CEOs, every single company is some kind of is in some kind of digital transformation and they want to grow more digital, but it's very hard to do it uh, fast enough. The, the, the pace of companies is not as fast as CEOs want it to be. And the knowledge about digital resides with those young people that are the millennials. And, and if they can, uh, use their knowledge and make it useful for companies growing digital, then you really have a big career uh, ahead of you. Absolutely. Um, one of the, uh, it's very interesting what you say, and your second chapter, the head of your, you know, the, um, the title of your second chapter is CEOs Want Your Power. Uh, I hope we're talking to a lot of millennials out there who can benefit from what you're saying, but give us a little insight into what that means. Um, yeah, what it exactly means depends on the type of business that you're in. So, um, for instance, I, I mostly work with advertisers, so, so I do uh, a lot of uh, work in digital branding, uh, digital advertising, those kinds of things. And what you see there is, for instance, that a lot of traditional TV advertisers are very used to uh, just taking a TV commercial, put it in, putting it on TV and blasting everyone away. Whereas in the digital world, it works completely differently. You can't just force people to watch your ads. You need to be more relevant. But at the same time, you have way more opportunities. So you can, get, can create longer commercials. You can create multiple videos. You can create a whole video content strategy. And what you, I think if you would be a millennial and you go into these companies, you would be surprised how old-fashioned their strategies still are. And, and, and that 
they, for instance, might not have a, a decent YouTube channel or a decent Facebook strategy, and they're still blasting their TV commercials. And so if, if you would walk in a company and see that and, and happen to be very good at uh, building a YouTube channel, you can basically build a whole career out of that within a big uh, advertiser. So about YouTube and building a YouTube channel, um, it's important to build one, but what's your advice on on getting people to come to watch? I mean, do you think it's an advertising strategy or is it sponsored content? Um, what's your view on on getting getting people, once you've built a YouTube channel, getting people to come and watch what you're offering? It is a mix of everything a little bit. We, we have a, a model that we call uh, Hero Help Hub. And that, that model basically is, it, it was based on the success of YouTube Hero. So, so at some point within the YouTube platform, we saw that, that just regular people making movies from their uh, bedrooms, uh, like makeup tutorials or gaming reviews or tech reviews, are actually the first ones to, to get millions of subscribers because they somehow nailed the platform. They discovered first how to make it work. And we used them as an example for really big brands to show what YouTube can do for them. So we dived into the channel of, of, of famous YouTubers and looked at the patterns on what types of content they create. And we discovered this pattern of hero, help, and hub, where hero is actually the, the hero. It's hero, help, and hub. And, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm not getting hub. that last so word. Uh, yeah, it's hub, hub, so H-U-B. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, oh, I might hub. not be pronouncing it right. Yeah, exactly. OK, yeah. hero, help, and hub. Got it. OK. Yeah, Thank and you. and these yeah. are three types of content. One is more push-related content, the, the content that you would advertise, and help content is focused around uh, commonly asked questions that people have online. So if people go online and they look for inspiration on makeup, on hair. If you would exactly yeah. know the types of questions people ask, you can uh, tailor your videos towards the questions they have. And then you have hub content, which is meant to bring people back time after time to your channel. So it is a bit about uh, thinking about a TV format, but then for video that allows you to publish a new movie every week in a similar concept, but with a refreshing topic. Mm -hmm. So consistency is important as well. Um, you know, yeah, so you definitely. Have a certain, like a certain segment that you would do every week. Uh, like here we do live chats um, on booktrip.com. Uh, which we do several times a week, and people come back to watch watch the live chats like we're doing with you today. Um, I th it's it's fascinating. I think you know we're, there's so many things to do. Whether you have a Facebook strategy, you have a YouTube strategy, you have a an Instagram strategy. Um, it used to only be one strategy. Now they're like sort of a whole wheel and many spokes in the wheel. Which do you you know? How do you manage that? I mean, how do you advise people to manage? all these different uh, potential ways to reach new new customers. I think that is indeed the most difficult aspect of the digital world. So it used to be uh, the briefing when traditional media people would just say, well, we're going to create a TV commercial, a few print ads, a radio ad, and then you know roughly what the media plan is. And now suddenly you have all kinds of specialisms, you have hundreds of ad formats you can choose from. And so what you see happening in the digital world is that you get people focused around a very narrow discipline, and they're really good at what they do. So you might indeed have one person that's very good at building a YouTube channel and a different one very good at, at, at doing uh, Facebook uh, messages. And But they're so specialized that they forget to take a little bit of a distance and look at the overall strategy. So I think one of the things that will make you really successful uh, as a millennial is if, if you can first find that specialism that really has your passion, but then uh, make, sh make sure that you zoom out and, and understand how your specialism fits in the overall strategy so it becomes easy for uh, a broad strategy person to embed what you're doing in their overall uh, thinking. So you bring up a good point, which is certainly what you talk about in the book. It means how, how to deal with your, uh, you know, sort of your managers in your group, how much to offer about how much you know as a millennial about the digital world, how much to, you know, because sometimes people don't know their boundaries or they think that there are boundaries and they're not sure how much to offer um, offer up with new information. What would be your advice there? Yeah, well, I think 
the biggest risk for a millennial that enters a new company is that they walk in and then they look around and they're surprised how old-fashioned the strategy actually is. And then they immediately sh start shouting that everything is crap and old-fashioned and needs to be done different. And if you do that, then you're going to bump into a lot of walls because you're the, like the, you're at the bottom of the food chain. You're just new to the company and, and, and you still have to earn your credits and you can't just shout around that everything is crap. And so you need to find a bit of a balance and, and you need to first build your network of people, ask them about the strategy, why the strategy is what it is. And very often the company already tried to build a YouTube channel, but they bumped into certain challenges that are actually valid challenges. And, and if you at least know that they already tried it, then you can appreciate the fact that they tried and, and then start helping uh, to overcome the challenges that they already defined themselves. And that's a much better way to get started than to just walk in and say everything is crap and needs to be done different and then, then bumping into walls. Right. So we so we come back to what's really one of the most important things is communication and understanding how to communicate with your colleagues and those that are your managers. You know, uh, and communication is something that is not digital, but it has been going on. Um, you know, for, for successful people from the beginning of time, and that's something that we all have to exercise: is how to fit in and how to communicate with people in your group so that you can be accepted, so that you can be listened to. That's very good advice for millennials working in, in, in companies today. Um, you say that... Yeah, but my culture, big recommendation... Yeah. But my big recommendation would be if you enter a new job in a new company, spend the first month at least, maybe even the first two months, do nothing else than asking questions. And, and, and just bite your tongue. Uh, don't try to immediately change stuff. Just ask questions all the time. And then what you will discover is that people are already doing quite a lot of great stuff, even though it is not perfect. And you will also find the people that already have great ideas to do new things, but that might have failed. And then, then you have found your supporters so you can build new innov innovative stuff together with them. That's excellent advice. Excellent advice. Ask questions and really sort of just absorb exactly what you're doing and what's going on. I mean, that, that's so positive. That um, you know that that's that's really wonderful advice. Um, you say in the book that culture and ways of working can be a rude awakening for millennials uh, when starting their careers. Um, is that to sort of a continuation to what you were just saying that um, that things aren't moving fast enough? Would you say that that's one of the things that's a rude awakening for some millennials? Yeah, I think that's that's definitely one of them. So so. You, if you look from the outside to big brands and big companies, you, you would expect that everything is uh, high tech and high end and that, that everything is right. And mostly from the inside, it's not as shiny as, 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 as you would expect it to be, particularly not when it comes to digital innovations. And so that's, that's the first thing you will bump into. And I think another one is, is that as soon as you try changing existing ways of working, you will discover that not everyone likes change. So that's that's definitely that can sometimes be very disappointing because you think you have great ideas and you want people to embrace it and, and then you might bump into people that just don't want to change things. And uh, sometimes that is just because people don't like change and sometimes it's actually because they consider you to be an internal competitor. What, what we have seen happening in a lot of companies is that digital started out as a very small department really specialized and then there was the, the, the traditional marketing team still or the traditional advertising team in a different department and then the digital department gradually became bigger and bigger and bigger and suddenly the whole digital transformation is not just doing new things it becomes an internal battle over resources so one team actually needs to cut out people cut jobs etc while the other one becomes bigger they get new people new jobs more money and, and so people are actually losing their jobs and are considering you their, their competitor. And that's, that's sometimes very hard to, to swallow. That's a very difficult spot to be in. Um, yeah, so your advice on that, if you're viewed as a competitor, is just to sort of bite the bullet and offer up, be very positive, ask a lot of questions, sort of go back to what you said a moment ago. Is that what you would recommend? Yeah, and, and what I think is you need to partner up with uh, the, the older generation. So what, what they have is sometimes 
the strategic knowledge that you only get after lots of years of working experience and then they know how the company works and if they start seeing you as a person that can help them grow more digital and not as a competitor that's out for getting their job then you can partner with them and what will happen is they will actually help you uh, guide your ideas through the organization and by doing that you help them become more digital which means you help them save their jobs and if you as soon as you find that balance then i think both are better off and it's also better for the company because you also want to keep as a company you want the millennials to flourish and the, the, the digital ideas to spread through the company and at the same time you want to save the mature uh, uh, strategic knowledge that's in your company you don't, you don't want to to lose all these uh, good people that already were there for, for a lot of years absolutely we have a, uh, a couple of questions coming in from the outside kate asks what are some strategies that advertisers advertisers should be thinking about in 2015 I think 2015 is actually the year where advertisers already should start the experiments that make them ready for 2025. And, uh, and that's actually what, what um, in, in August, there's a new book coming out called uh, Online Brand Identity. And that one uh, particularly focuses on, uh, it looks 10 years ahead and makes a statement that in about 10 years, uh, about 80% of all the advertising is going to be digital in all media, so it includes TV, radio, radio, print, outdoor. It's all going to be digital, and it's going to be programmatic. That means that it's uh, 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 bought with automated trading systems. And that kind of thinking is very different from what we have today. And, and, and a lot of stuff needs to, to change. So, for instance, you can't just create a TV commercial and blast it away. So you, so you need to think in terms of content strategy. So the hero, help, and hub concept that I just explained. And, and you need to learn how to make a nice, uh, engaging brand experience experiences with the latest technology. And, and you need to use data in a different way. Almost everything you do changes. And that requires a learning curve of at least like through three or four years. So you have to start today running experiments to get ready for 2025. And if you wait until the moment that what you're doing now is not working anymore, then probably you will be too late and, and, and other players will start meaning. Okay, I'm, I'm listening very closely to that, given that we have a site, our, what, what we're on today, which is booktrib.com. So we're paying a lot of attention for, for, from our own perspective. So thank you for that. Is that your book that's coming out, Online Brand Identity? Is that yours? Is that yes. your next book? Okay, and yeah. that's coming out this August. Yes, yeah, really fast. It, 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 it was a bit of a surprise for myself. When, when I finished uh, Thinking Grow Digital, I said, well, I'm not going to write a, a book anymore for the next uh, few uh, months or at least a year. And uh, because, because I wrote two books before this one. This, this, uh, so the upcoming one is the fourth book in four years' time. And, uh, but when I finished uh, Think and Grow Digital, I suddenly had this idea about how do you build a brand if you think 10 years ahead? What, what's, what's the future brand strategy? It, it's literally the work that I do for Google in a book. Uh, so because, because I run uh, digital first workshops with big, big advertisers and I literally in the workshop, fast forward 10 years, take away all the tools that they use today and I build a strategy with all the new tools and then at the end of the workshop, we move back to today and we look at what are the experiments we should start running tomorrow to actually get to the future. And, and I, I noticed in the workshops that this resonated so well with audiences that I just said, well, I have to write this book. And, 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 and from the moment when I had it in my head, it took me th three months to have actually finished the whole book. And I got a publisher and it's going to be out uh, next month. Wow, we'd love to have you back for part two of this conversation. So let's get that on the calendar. We'd love that. By the way, if, ever, if anybody is just tuning in right now, we have a live chat today with Joris Merckx, who is the European Head of Insight Communication at Google, and he is with us from the Netherlands. And we're talking about his new book, Think and Grow Rich. Sorry, Think and Grow Digital. Um, there was a book in the U.S., Think and Grow Rich, but it's Think and Grow Digital. Uh, what is the net generation? What the net generation needs to know to survive and thrive in any organization? We're talking about leadership. We're talking about millennials. We're talking about advertising in the digital age. Um, and I'd like to ask a little bit about sponsored content. 
do you think that sponsored content, does that fit into the HHH that you just explained, the hero, help, and hub? Uh, yes, I think it does, yeah, if, if you do it in the right way. So what, what, what we very often see is um, as soon as advertisers discover that they need to create more than one video and a few print ads, that suddenly you might need to create 100 videos to, to really have a nice ecosystem of videos that answer all kinds of questions and that, that where you have a few big hero moments and where you have every week a new episode within your format, then the next question is how do I create all these videos, you know, because they're used to creating one big video that might cost a, a few hundred K and suddenly you need to create a hundred videos for the same budget or maybe maybe a little bit less. And so then you get to the point, how, how am I going to create these, these videos? And, and very often advertisers start cooperating with uh, famous YouTube creators or, or, or our kinds of creators. Uh, so together they, they create what we call branded content and, and, and it could be sponsored content. And, and when done in the right way, I think this can be very valuable. Who's doing it right? Who can you say, what advertisers are doing a really good job of what you're describing uh, today? Um, there are quite, quite a lot actually. So in, in my new book I have uh, basically a brand model, which is a brand model around digital first thinking. And I illustrate that model with about 40 branding cases of, of advertisers that are really doing a great job at least implementing some of the principles. And I think in terms of content strategy, a content strategy is one of the pillars of digital first uh, thinking, uh, the Triple H model. Uh, one, one example that I really like is uh, Volvo Trucks who became uh, famous with the epic split from Jean-Claude Van Damme, you probably know it. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh, Jean-Claude yeah. Van Damme, that, and, uh, yes, I can think of it. Yes, yeah, so th they have a great Triple H framework, and, and the epic split, uh, where Jean-Claude Van Damme makes a split between two trucks, and the trucks are driving backwards, and it illustrates the precision of, of dynamic steering of the, 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 the Volvo trucks, and that, that's their hero concept, so the, the hero concept is, and whenever they have a truck or something else and they want to highlight a certain feature, they think about a nice stunt they, they can do with the feature and they create uh, advertising that people want to watch rather than have to watch. And But they also have great hub content, which is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, MTV Crip kind of content, which is called, um, what was the name again? Uh, Welcome to my cab is the name. So it, it is MTV Crips for truckers. So they, they look for truckers. Uh, that have a nice customized truck with nice painting on it and, 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 and new engines, etc. And the trucker basically shows off his truck and says what he had customized and stuff. So that's a really great hub format and they, they have new videos every week. And then they have help content, which is about commonly asked questions around trucks, where they cooperate with a guy called, I'm not sure what his name was again, but he's a, a truck journalist. So, so he already created uh, content around trucks and articles. Brian is his name. He has Brian's truck report. And uh, so he's a journalist and he just answers commonly asked questions around trucks and he creates a video explaining dynamic steering and all kinds of stuff. So they, they really have a nice channel with all kinds of cool content. So I think what you're saying is go wide to your audience, but also go very deep and narrow. So pick your niche audience. I think niche audience are very more important now than ever. Being able to target those audiences as opposed to just putting out something that targets everybody and may not interest many. Um, that yeah. you're, we, we actually uh, we, we call it targeting at scale. So targeting at scale. What we used, yeah. So what we used to do is have one message and just blast it away which means it's yep. not relevant for a lot of people. And right. that just worked. It worked because of the way TV works. TV allows you to force stuff on people. And yeah. within the digital world, it just doesn't work anymore because people have so many choices in terms of content, they will just move around the advertising. So what you need to do instead is, is, is use the opportunity that digital has, the unique creative canvas, the fact you can create a lot of movies to still have scale, to talk to a lot of people, but each gets their own message at the right moment uh, and something that fits their needs of that moment. Yeah, I mean, that, the way you descri describe the truckers, I mean, that's really a very a niche market, but a large market. 
um, with you know a lot of content that you wouldn't think of, but clearly a lot of content uh, that they could feel good about being part of, which gets to other other truckers and then the journalism the journalist as well. How much progress is being made in terms of integration between online and offline marketing? Um, we're getting that from somebody named Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you very much for your question. Yeah, I think it's getting better, but definitely not going very fast. Um, and, and the biggest barrier that I see there is, is that the online and the offline people are housed, are housed in separate teams and they have separate targets. And, and what you see very often is that the digital department is, for instance, an e-commerce team. So it would be a team that has a target on selling stuff in an online shop. And, and they do a lot of digital advertising focused on, on immediate buying signals, which we call performance advertising. And then the offline department would be, if it's an advertising offline department, focused around the brand. And they more or less focus on, 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 on reaching broad audiences with one, one size fits all messaging. And sometimes they do stuff a little bit with content strategy, uh, but the majority of the budget still go to traditional media. And they have uh, very often targets on offline sales, or they might have targets on brand awareness or something else. And because these two departments have conflicting targets, the, 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 the incentive to work together is very limited. Because what, what a consumer would expect is if you go into the online shop and you see, for instance, shoes, but you uh, want to feel the fabric of the shoes and you want to fit them, that the online shop recommends you to go to some kind of offline shop to try the shoes. But if you have a target or nothing else but online sales, then it's actually a lost opportunity for you to sell within this specific digital session if you would refer a person away from your website. So if you get incentivized for online sales, nothing else, uh, then, then it's, it's very unlikely that an online department will start sending away a lot of people because they think they might be uh, more inclined to buy in an offline shop. Yeah, I mean, it is a little confusing with big stores who now have, they don't have everything in stock. So if you want to go to the big store and see something, they sometimes tell you, well, go look online. So as a consumer, um, there, it seems like they're not, there's not a cohesive discussion in the company or it's not, it's not, it's not making it easier for the consumer. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Um, they, they don't have as much inventory as they used to. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the, the, the two channels are complementary. So, so online you just have way more products, way more choice, etc. Whereas offline you have someone to speak to and you can feel the, the, the fabrics, you can try it. So uh, I would say the, 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 the store personnel should be uh, mostly advising you about color, shapes, and uh, textures, and, and, and etc. And then say, well, if, if you like this shoe, but we don't have it in your color, we do have it in 10 more colors and 20 more sizes online, and help you find the product online and say, well, I can order it here right now for you if you want, and then it will be at your house the next morning. And But because the offline store personnel is mostly, uh, um, uh, they, they get rewarded for offline sales, then they don't, they're not so inclined to actually help you make an online purchase. And, and that is something that needs fixing in almost every organization. And I think particularly the smaller organizations are faster in, at fixing it than the bigger ones, because in the smaller organizations, the online and the offline people are sitting in the same room. So it's easier for them to, to start integrating strategies. I think you've nailed it. You've nailed it right there as to what's happening. Um, I had an experience at Crate and Barrel this past weekend, and they were terrific at integrating uh, the two, the offline and the online. And it was very impressive because they clearly had a lot in the store, but they didn't have everything. And the gentleman I was working with, he took me aside. He walked me over. He told me why several things were good. He said, touch this, look at this, da, da, da. And then he showed me online that I could get all these different things. And they, they, um, that store, I think, is doing exactly what, what you've described. And it was, was a great experience because you could see what you're getting, yet you could, and then you could see what you might want online and then order it and have it very quickly. So I think, but I'm, not everybody is doing that well, but that is the, um, I mean, we do want to have stores that we can go to physically. I mean, do you think that everything will be online at some point in 2025? Is that what we're looking at? Or no. do you think we always will have stores? 
I think you will always have stores there. But, but what you're describing is exactly what I mean. And, and from a com consumer's perspective, it's so logical that companies should be doing this. And at the same time, it doesn't really happen because of the way they are structured. But I, I, I think stores will always be important. So there, there's a lot of uh, behavior shifting towards online. And, and, and for some products, people will just buy them online and, and will not do it offline anymore. But I think people will enjoy going to the store and they will want to sometimes feel a fabric or just fit something first. So they will want advice, etc. But the role of the store is just becoming different. So, so companies need to, need to balance, uh, they need to rethink what the role of the offline store is compared to the online store and make it compatible with each other, but also complement, complementary. That's a, that's a huge, that's a huge tip. And, 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 and it makes me think about my shopping a little differently. So thank you for that. Um, Susan asked, um, does, uh, in, do you use the Google market research when you do, or when you advise in your advertising clients? Mm, yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I used to be, uh, I'm actually not in research anymore at Google. I, I switched uh, jobs. My current job is head of digital transformation. Uh, so right. I'm now about a bit more than five years at Google. And I was a researcher for about four and a half. And I did a lot of research on consumer journeys, particularly looking at how people use online and offline channels, how they mix them, both in buying and researching. So you might sometimes see that people research online and they compare products and then they still buy offline or they do it the other way around. So I, I actually showed advertisers how consumers are mixing channels and, and, and made a point how they should be integrating online and offline better. And I've done a lot of work on, on cross-media planning. So I, I built cross-media tools that allow you to, to plan online and offline campaigns at the same time. And I've learned a lot from that. But at the same time, I also discovered that data is always based on the past. And so if you uh, uh, want advice about what you should do to be future ready, you just can't get that information from data. And, and, and what I noticed in my conversations at some point is that I got in a chicken egg conversation more or less. So, so I challenged clients that they should do more digital first thinking. And they said to me, well, if you can prove it works, then we will do it. But you can only measure it after you do it. So you have to do it first and you have to do it big, otherwise you can't measure it. And, and, and then you can prove that it worked and you can optimize it. And so, so you got in this chicken egg uh, game and at some point I felt I wanted to move out of data and just focus on helping advertisers start those digital first experiments. So they actually start doing things first and then so I could help them afterwards to measure it better in new ways. Love it. That's fantastic. Think and Grow Digital is the book. We've been talking to Joris Merckx and um, he's head of digital transformation at Google in the Netherlands. We've loved having you on today. I hope you'll come back again when your next book comes out online brand identity we're looking forward to that in August um, and for those watching who would like to um, register to win a copy of Think and Grow Digital please go to booktrib.com and see this interview again read uh, a, a, a Q&A that we have with Joris on the site and uh, you can um, enter to win a copy of his book Joris thank you so much for your time thank you it's been a pleasure having you I've learned a lot I hope everybody else has learned a lot too and we look forward to having you back sometime soon thank you too and uh, I will be back thank you so much take a look at booktrip.com we'd love to know what you think I will great thank you bye okay thank you bye bye, -bye.